information. <laughs> hey, this equipment is working today. <laughs> hey, Jared, we got a little more meter going there. Hello, one, two, three, four. Hello, test. Doo, 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 doo. Little CW here. Da, 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 da. Uh, incidentally, before we uh, get this thing underway, I have to give you a word of warning. This is a disclaimer. The following program will prove to be inordinately dull to many of you. That is, you earthbound mortals whose soul does not soar into the happiness. I would suggest you tune down the dial. You'll find a wonderful salute they're doing down here. There. Julie Andrews, that unforgettable star of stage screen. And what was the name of that turkey? Uh, uh, sound of uh, music, they call it. Bring it up there. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, well, by the way, may I may I uh, say that uh, I'm getting more and more uh, cuckoo about flying. And uh, as a you know, as a pilot, I, you have your days. You know, you, some days you get a little more hipped on things than you do on other days. But uh, uh, qu- one of the most unusual flights I ever had in my life was on a Qantas plane that was going from Darwin uh, to Sydney. Now, take uh, if you have a map out, just take a take a look at the Australian. Well, I guess it's a continent. It's a big. Um, you know, there's always been a lot of argument as whether they should consider it a, the biggest island in the world or one of the smallest continents. But it's a big piece of land. And if you take a look at your map, you'll find that Darwin is way up in the northern tip of Australia, which is, of course, reverse to our way of thinking. The northern tip of Australia is the hot part of Australia. That's that's a tropical part of the world. Very tropical, very hot, and a very interesting-looking place. Darwin, you have a sense of, 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 a, of genuinely a, a foreign frontier when you're in Darwin. And this little town lays right on, the, on that low, flat coast that goes right down into the ocean there, and it's the tropical sea. And you know, that area right around Darwin was where tremendous battles were fought. In World War II, naval battles. Uh, that's not far from the Coral Sea and uh, Midway. And all those great battles were fought off there. And in fact, uh, I remember one Aussie uh, looking out over that blue sparkling water, that tropical water on the day I was in Darwin. He says, you know, mate, by the way, the word mate is used constantly. It's might. Uh, you know, might, uh, he points out, uh, they have a very fast way of talking and he says, you know, my, out there, he says, the water is there. Is it probably on the bottom there? It's uh, P with zeros. And, uh, yeah, the all the zeros that were shot down that were attacking in that area during World War II. And you're very close to the whole Asiatic complex when you're in Darwin. Well, I got on this aircraft, this Qantas air, uh, airplane, and took off from Darwin on a flight directly across the entire area of Australia to Sydney. Now, you'll take a look at your map. you got the map. You'll find that Sydney's way down on the southern end. And uh, that's, uh, that's a beautiful city, by the way. Darwin is, is, is removed and remote from the way Sydney feels, as, let's say, a Skowhegan, Maine, is from uh, New York City. There. <laughs> it's such a different feel. But nevertheless, uh, incidentally, Darwin is named after Darwin, of course, the famous Charles Darwin. And uh, this is one of the areas that he touched. You know, when you, if you've ever read the history of, uh, of Australia, it's a fantastic place. And that uh, the, uh, one, of the, one of the great pieces of reading I've done recently is Alan Moorhead's writing about the, the trip of the Beagle, the great classic voyage of, of Darwin's boat, or at least the boat that Darwin was on, which was a great voyage of research. And uh, that area down there, when they, when they write about the first, landfall when the great trip has been made from England and it's month after month after month after month goes on you see uh, when you're traveling by sailing vessel from England from say Southampton or from from uh, one of the English ports and sailing out over the vast expanses of the ocean till finally you reach Australia it's literally the other end of the world and it's a it's it's probably one of the great epic voyages of, of its time in fact in the days when they were sailing to Australia, uh, that trip was the tatam- was tatamount in that time to space travel. It really very parallel to space travel because it was such unknown and the dangers were so unknown and the wild weather that they hit in some of those uh, tropical areas. And then, they, of course, it, it also traverses the, the Arctic, Antarctic, really. 
and uh, they they go all the way from these this fantastic Antarctica weather to uh, to ultimately they get into the hottest tropical areas in the world, and of course they traverse all through seasons and everything else, and it was totally unknown back in the 19th century, in the early 19th century. So when guys would come back from Australia, they were considered as rare, exotic, and as fascinating as, say, today a guy comes back from the moon. And they told stories that nobody would believe. In fact, the first guys that came back from Australia, the first explorers that came out here to Australia, when they returned, there was universal disbelief. Universal. In fact, the scientific community put down the stories that the first uh, non-scientific explorers had. For example, no one would believe that there was an animal like the uh, kangaroo. These guys come back and describe kangaroos, and everybody says, "What are you talking about?" Now tell us about the dragon, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and and so they were the the kangaroo, and and uh, believe me, and I can understand why no one would believe it. I'll never forget driving in a car outside of Sydney one night, a few, oh, it was a hundred or so miles out of Sydney, driving in a car, when all of a sudden in the headlamp, headlights of this car, it was a kind of a hilly territory there, there was something moving, and I saw it going across the road, this fantastic kangaroo. Can you imagine a kangaroo jumping across the road in front of your car? Well, you know these kangaroos are about five feet tall. These are not little things like, you know, the big baby, and boom, boom, he jumps across, his eyeballs glowing in the dark, you know, and his arms floating all over the place, and he's got a giant tail, and he sails off into the bushes. I said, my God, look out, you know. I thought to myself, man, this Australian beer must be something, you know. I, I can't conceivably believe that such a thing is there. <laughs> and, and, and yet, it, uh, you know, of course, it turns out that the, that the Australians, the, uh, the kangaroo is probably, uh, it's a great scourge in parts of Australia. They look upon the kangaroo the way a lot of people in certain farm areas look upon the rabbit. You know, he destroys crops, everything else. And uh, over there, he's, uh, there he is. And they're really there. I remember sitting in a guy's yard one night. Did you ever hear the kookaburra bird? Which is the, which is the national bird of Australia. It's a fantastic sound. <laughs> he yells out. And it's a wild sound. And by the way, speaking of the kookaburra bird... I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing it correctly. There's a lot of ways to pronounce these things. But this bird used to be, I remember when I was a kid, and I was a shortwave listener, I first fell fantastically in love with Australia because the Australian shortwave stations, VK2ME and VK3, uh, I think we call the other call sign. I'm trying to think of what VK2ME was Melbourne, of course. It stood for Melbourne. And their prefix is VK just like our prefix here in the United States is W. All U.S. stations are either W or K. And uh, anybody in the world who hears a W, he knows it's a, it's a U.S. station. This is an international code. Uh, and if you hear a K, it's also a U.S. station. Incidentally, if it's a U.S. possession, it's often uh, preceded with a, uh, with a well, actually, it's a dual uh, call sign, like, say, KL, uh, which is Alaska, I believe now, KL or uh, KU or KG, which is Guam, uh, various different, KH. So anywhere that you hear a K, you know this is a U.S. station. Well, Australia was VK. And I remember VK2ME used to identify itself. I don't know whether they still do or not. Across the world, you'd sit there and you'd tune in their, their frequency. And you'd, it's a tough thing to do, you know, if you're, if you're living in the Midwest to tune in Australia on a homemade uh, short wave set. And uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I would, finally, I would finally hear it. They had, as their signature, they didn't use uh, a regular uh, spoken signature like we do here in this country. They used the sound of the kookaburra bird. And all you would hear, there'd be silence. The, they wouldn't even be broadcasting a program. And they would just mark their frequency. You'd just hear, and it would echo throughout the world. And anybody who heard this knew they were listening to Australia. And he used to come floating in over 12,500 miles of space and it had a curious, eerie quality to it. And at that point, I thought, you know, Australia. And every, you know, I'm amazed at the number of Americans. Not amazed. It doesn't surprise me, really, I suppose. The number of people who have a great interest in Australia. You mention Australia, a lot of people are turned down immediately. And for good reason. I, I, I uh, It's one of the most exciting countries I've ever visited. I 
recommend, I mean, if any of you have never done it, you ought to try it once, and you'll never, you'll never turn back. One of the greatest expenditures you can ever make in your life is travel. I mean it. Because if you live to be a hundred years old, you have always seen Australia or Fiji or New Zealand, and you will always remember it. It's very hard to really remember about the Ford you drove in 1964, <laughs> which, by the way, cost three times the cost of, of a trip to Australia. And, uh, I, I, you know, it's, it, when you talk about reordering your, uh, I suppose you can say your priorities, your basic internal priorities, your own personal priorities, one of the first things you begin to learn if you're a certain kind of person, I suspect that many pe people never learn this, that physical possessions are a drag. I'll let that soak in. You can kill yourself with them. You, you, uh, physical possessions can ruin your life. I have felt that the more things you own, the more your life is, is, uh, is surrounded by this great uh, kind of a cocoon of impedimentia. And it, it, it eventually can bury you so much that you can't even move. you got so many payments to begin with on all this junk. And, and on top of that, you, you're totally immobile. And so when you, when you surround yourself with thousands and thousands of things, the idea of moving a, a block, or if you're going to move a, a, to the next town, is a major operation and you don't do it. In many cases, you should. And I, I, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I, I'm, I suppose it's existentialism or something. I, I, I hate to use any isms in connection with this. But from the time I began to travel seriously, which was about 1957, I, I went around the world in 1957. From that time on, uh, I've, never, I've never lost it. And uh, it's, in fact, if anything, grown more. I look forward to each succeeding moment of a trip. This is W.O.R. New York. How do you do, Mr. Sponsor? How do you do? Here's the time for a commercial for you. We'd be glad to put it in. If you get up the tin, how do you do, Mr. Sponsor? How do you do? Your AMC dealer announces Test Drive Days. Test drive days make it easy for you to meet the 1974 Matador. Meet the Matador Coupe, the new mid-size car that's as exciting as its name. The 1974 Matador Coupe looks exciting, clean, uncluttered, contemporary. But we know you don't buy a car on looks alone. That's why we invite you to test drive this exciting new Matador during your AMC dealer's test drive days. Because a test drive is the only way to get to know a car. And we want you to get to know the 1974 Matador. See your AMC dealer, where you get a good deal, and a good deal more. And by the way, one of the things you have to learn about traveling is... You ought to seriously think inside yourself. What would you really like to see? Where would you really like to go? Where have you always been intrigued by? Instead of, let's go to Paris, let's go to London. In other words, the usual things that people automatically do, uh, and I'm not putting those places down, I'm simply saying... Where in your, in your, just all, with, if there was nothing else involved, if there was no other uh, things that uh, could hold you back, what, where, where would you like to go? With no other consideration. Forget money. I mean, just try to throw everything else out of your mind and simply say, what place in the world would you like to see? Well, all right. Lee holds up a thing, a little sign, and she says, Khartoum. I've been to Khartoum, and believe me, it's worth a visit. I mean, if, if, you see, the thing about going to a place like Khartoum, for one thing, can you imagine what a fantastic leg up that gives you at a cocktail party? Why is it a status thing? Well, I'll tell you why it's a status thing. Damn few people have been to Khartoum, that's why. Seriously. 
and don't think it isn't worth a visit. However, uh, I, from, from the time I was a kid, now I can't explain why, I've always wanted to see Australia. Now, uh, I can tell you a lot of things about Australia. Anybody who's ever been there has been turned on by it in a curious sort of way. Very different from, from other types of excitement. For one thing, Australia, when, when you get out to Australia, the first thing that hits you is, well, if this is what hit me, was how clean everything is. There's a tremendous sense of, 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 of sky, fantastic skies, enormous uh, distances, and the people are just naturally appealing. I, I, I happen to like Australians very much. Uh, you know, for one thing, Australians are very, uh, are very active people. These are, not, these are not people, and I'm not saying they're not intellectual, because there is a great intellectual life in a lot of, your, a lot of areas of Australia, but they're people who are doers. I, I always enjoyed being around doers. There's a sense of life about them. These are people who, who uh, experience life rather than write about it or talk about it. It's a big difference. And uh, when you're out in Australia, you, you get this sense of tremendous... Uh, anything's possible, you feel. And it generally is, actually. And, uh, and one of the great the movies, I think, uh, every time it shows up on television that I always watch, really, you should, you should watch it if you get a chance to watch it. It's a tremendous performance. I think one of the unapplauded uh, actors of our time who is, I, never fails to be good and, and he's never been uh, dull in anything I've ever seen him is Robert Mitchum. Uh, if you get a chance to see Mitchum in The Sundowners, tremendous movie. And it's about Australia. It's about the outback. Now, I have flown over the outback, and uh, I've experienced a little of the edge of it. And that's what I was going to say, that I took this trip, this flight from Darwin, which cuts directly across the, uh, the continent of Australia. It cuts it at a diagonal right down to Sydney, and it's a long flight. And we flew at a, at a very high altitude, and maybe 38, 39,000 feet. And the air was as clear as crystal. And I can't remember in my life, outside of possibly one flight, one night under certain conditions over the Sahara. Anything that impressed me as much as that flight over the Australian outback. It, it is very close to what you've seen in pictures of the moon. It resembles the moon very closely. And in a lot of ways, it's, uh, the terrain is, uh, is geologically even similar, I've, uh, I've heard. And so you see these, these fantastic great dipping craters and dried riverbeds of prehistoric rivers. And it is prehistoric. You, you travel over places where no man, to their knowledge, has ever put a foot. You travel over places where the surface temperature rarely falls during the day below 130 degrees all the time. No trails, no tracks, nothing. True wilderness. And you can see... For miles and miles, you just look out over fantastic expanses. And at night, of course, like most uh, desert areas, the temperature plunges. So it's great differences in temperature. You know that I, I was in a, in a house in the, in the part of the outback where the kids go to school there by radio. They're so widely separated that they have a two-way radio, a regular transmitter and receiver setup. This is not walkie-talkie. I'm talking about a big time, and it's not CB, friends. Forget that. This is a big transmitter, and the guy's back. This is where he, the way he's connected with the outside world. And uh, he, uh, the kid every morning turns on the transmitter and the receiver and waits, and the thing warms up, and there's his teacher calling roll. And he answers by, <laughs> he throws the switch, she calls his name, and he says, here, and then he throws the switch, and that's the it. See? And she asks some questions. They, they have a regular class that's separated by hundreds and hundreds of miles. You know, it's a very exciting place. And, and these, these uh, outback of ranches or farms, these, these great establishments, they all have airstrips. And so daily, the, the postman comes whipping along in his Cessna, and uh, he lands, he delivers the mail, takes off, and he's off again. And it's a, it's a fantastic place. Well, now, I, you know, talking about stories of Australia, that one of the great flights that I've ever taken in my life was that flight from Darwin to Sydney, and it was a whole crowd of Australians aboard. It was a totally Australian flight. And it was not a tourist flight. It was a, it was a local flight. 
if you can call it local. It would be the equivalent of a local U.S. flight from, say, New York to Los Angeles. And uh, so here I was, sitting with all these Australians, and by an odd coincidence, I got on a plane where there was a whole group of Australians who were coming to Sydney for the celebration of Anzac Day. Now, have you ever heard of Anzac Day? Well, Anzac Day is one of the great national holidays of Australia. In fact, it's probably the biggest national holiday of Australia. That is a specific Australian holiday. And Anzac Day has to do with World War I. And uh, it has to do with, uh, with the Anzacs. Uh, Anzac, of course, you know what Anzac stands for. And uh, the Anzac soldiers who had uh, died at Tripoli. It was a tremendous big battle there, and, and thousands and thousands of them died. And for, for ever since that time, Anzac Day has been one of the great uh, memorial days of Australia. And, of course, they're so remote that the, that the currents of, of uh, things that travel through the world, uh, like traveling through our Western world here, that have not really reached Australia, except in sort of a peripheral way. And... Uh, and so we're, we're in the age of the put-down. You know, everybody is putting this country down, no matter where you go. I mean, you go, you go to uh, France, uh, the, you, all you got to do is holler out the window, and within five minutes you've got 400,000 guys assembled hollering, ah, yeah, cut out, cut out, you know, yelling, uh, blow it up, kill. Uh, you go to England, you get the, the whole put-down scene. Well, they haven't heard of that <laughs> yet in Australia, and Australians love Australia. It's a very interesting thing to go to a place, a country, where the people dig the country. You know, here they are, they're... they're, they're it's a, it's a very odd experience. Now, we're, we're, we're so used to the put-down that we think that's the normal way of life, that this is the way it is, but it isn't so in Australia. And, of course, there's, in every country, there's always a group of people who are raising cane in one way or another. But, in general, you get this sense of, of uh, kind of well-being. It's a, it's a curious sense of integration of the Australian with his environment. And so, I'm in this plane, and all these guys of thousands of fat housewives, the whole plane is loaded. It's family type, you know, people. And they're, they're all going to, us, to to Sydney. And half of them have never been to Sydney, you see. They're, this is like a lifetime of uh, planning to go to Sydney. It would be like how many people in Queens have ever actually flown on a plane to San Francisco. It's a big event in their life. So I'm in the middle of all this, you see. I'm, I'm a real alien. And they discovered I was an American. So we talked and argued for hours uh, flying over this fantastic outback country. And they all carry their lunches and stuff on board, which is something I've never seen on an airplane. But they, you know, they're all sitting there. And, of course, on top of that, they eat what the stewardess brings them, which is... <laughs> so, oh, yeah, these are stout trenchermen. So uh, we, we finally got into, uh, into the Sydney area, and, boy, Sydney is something to see. Uh, Sydney reminds me very, very much of San Francisco. The city is, is very similar to San Francisco. They've got a huge bridge out across Sydney Bay there, and it's a beautiful, beautiful city. Uh, but the the whole feeling in in uh, Australia was a, was different from the way I thought it would be, and it's and it, it's not. Uh, there's a very difficult for me to describe it to you, and I'm not again attempting to sell you on Australia like every other country. Now let's face one thing, friends, in our lives, we're going to have to face one thing. There's no such thing as paradise, and uh, wherever you go, you will find flaws in the particular social structure of wherever you go. It depends on which flaw bugs you most. Uh, and and, and that's, that's a personal thing. You will find many people will find Australia intolerable because they don't find the rich, deep uh, coffee shops sitting around intellectual life that you may find, say, in New York or you may find in Paris. On the other hand, there are vast areas of attitude and feeling that you will find in Australia that you won't find in places like New York and, uh, well, Paris. Incidentally, I think Sydney has to be included in one of the world's great cities. Uh, when you talk about great cities, what are the great cities? Well, Tokyo, uh, Los Angeles it has to be considered, Chicago, uh, New York, Paris, Rome, Amsterdam, London. These are great cities, big league cities. You see, these are these are cities that uh, that are countries unto themselves. And uh, uh, you know, one of the one of the odd things about Australia, I, I took a I took a plane from Sydney one morning. One of the one of the fantastic experiences of my life. Of if I'm using the word fantastic a great deal, it's because Australia is that. It is almost a fantasy to you, to us, to a person like uh, 
you know, walking around America. First of all, we're used to things that are difficult to do. In a country like ours, which is a vastly populated country, things get difficult, right? It's hard to do things. It's, uh, it takes planning, and, and uh, there's turnpikes, and there's traffic jams, and lines and stuff. Well, one morning I decided that I was going to take a plane, a local plane, uh, one of the very few airlines in the world that uses exclusively flying boats for its service. They have these old Sunderlands, great flying boat, four-engine flying boats that uh, were used as uh, low-level bombers, actually, and observation planes in World War II. And they used these flying boats to fly out of Sydney Harbor to a couple of ports that lie off the Australian coast. Now, if you take a look at your Australian map, you will see about four to, I think it's around 600 miles, maybe I'm wrong, maybe three or 400 miles. I'm, I'm, this is purely from memory. A tiny dot marked Lord Howe Island. Lord Howe Island, H-O-W-E. This is the furthest south, the furthest remote South Sea Island that could be accurately called a South Sea Island. Between Lord Howe Island and the South Pole, there's nothing. That's the end of it. If you leave Lord Howe and keep rowing south, there ain't nothing but water, icebergs, and finally the South Pole. Now, I took a plane that morning uh, out of uh, Sydney Harbor, and the, and the plane is sitting right there on the on the dock, right? It's like a boat. It's floating at the dock. They're beautiful. The sun shining on it. And uh, Nathan Simon and myself did this. An old buddy of mine, Simon, Simon Wide, a uh, great photographer, a friend of mine. We, we got on this plane, Simon Nathan, and we hopped on this beautiful Sunderland and taxied out on the bay, and she took off. And there were four or five, maybe six different couples of Australians that were going down there for the weekend. Well, Lord Howe Island is just exactly the island that whenever you hear the song Bally High, they are singing about. Friends, it is Bally High. In fact, uh, this island juts out of, the, out of the ocean there all by itself. Just this tremendous thing rises. And there are two enormous peaks that rise high and high and, uh, and uh, just seem to have a haze over the tops of them. They're covered in green, and there's a beautiful lagoon that dips into it and reefs, and it is visited by a boat roughly every three months. A boat arrives and brings supplies, and there were 150 people lived on Lord Howe Island, and uh, they had banana plantations. That's about it, just this uh, banana plantation and so on. And, uh, and you, you, we sailed down between these two peaks. They have to make the approach a specific way, and this, this, uh, this razor-sharp pilot, who incidentally had flown this same airplane, this is a really interesting story, as the squadron commander of an anti-submarine, patrol submarine, but they, they did nothing but anti-sub stuff, in the English Channel during World War II, and he's still flying the same airplane. <laughs> he knows every inch of it. So this, he just brought this thing down between two peaks, and I was up in the ray dome on the top. They have a they, they, these aircraft are so beautiful that the, on the top of them they have a big bubble, uh, which was used and is used, incidentally, for still plotting a course with the sextant, just the way uh, they do on the ocean-going vessels. And so once in a while the guy would get up there and he would check his course with the sextant and, and look at the stars and the various heavenly bodies and so on. And we, we finally laid it down on the bay, and the water was so clear... That it, you've seen these pictures of uh, of the Caribbean where where uh, you can see right down to the bottom of these people. So, listen, it makes that look like kid stuff. I want to tell you, this uh, we were floating in water that was about 25 or 30 feet deep, and there was an eerie sensation of the aircraft being sus actually suspended in air. You could see this this bottom down there below you, just absolutely sparkling white bottom with the you'd see a few rocks and then bit of coral growing up out of the bottom. And uh, out comes a speedboat. Uh, they anchor this thing uh, out in the middle of the bay. And the speedboat comes, and you take this boat into the shore. And here, built in this magnificent tropical paradise, are these cabins. And everybody eats uh, together. It's a communal thing. You, you come down, you all sit together that night, you eat, and you have your gin and tonic, and 
your Australian beer, which is as good as any beer, by the way, in the world. Uh, you And uh, I suspect that the average Australian drinks more beer, uh, more beer is drunk per capita in Australia than any other country in the world. Oh, they they live on it. So uh, <laughs> anyway, we, we, we pulled into the shore there, and I had been talking to the captain. Uh, he, he looked exactly the way a wing commander should look. I mean, he looked like uh, he looked like uh, the role that David Niven plays. You know, he had this little uh, sharp, aquiline face, bronze from the sun. He had these these narrow eyes. You can see he'd been looking into the sun for forty years, and that razor sharp, elegant uniform. And uh, he had a jeep that was that he kept there. And of course, the crew would stay there overnight. The plane would come. They would stay overnight, fly back. And this was a trip that was made once every two weeks. And so uh, he, he says, come on. He said, uh, if you'd like to see the island, I'd love to show it to you in my Jeep. And he had a Jeep. that he, It was his own Jeep he kept there. So we went over and got in the Jeep. It was an old World War II surplus Jeep. And uh, we drove up into this long, winding road to these tropical, uh, well, it was actually groves of uh, bananas and great overhanging palm trees. Absolutely solitude. Nothing there. Well, there's 150 people, a whole island. The island is about... I would guess about 15 or 20 miles long, about uh, 6 or 7 miles wide, and these two volcanic peaks that stick up. Just beautiful island. And so we finally rose, we, we drove up to where up at the top of a ridge, high, kind of a razorback ridge that ran right down like the spine of the island. And we could see this fantastic beach below us, a, a curving horseshoe beach, not a single soul on it. The, the sand is as white as crystal. You could see these waves rolling in. And they were rolling in from the South Pole. Just rolling in. Great, vast waves coming in. And the water was so clear. And, we're, and it was sunset. The sun was drifting down to the horizon. And way down below us, you could see the aircraft just floating at anchor down there with the sun shining on the wings. It was one of the most beautiful sights I think I've ever seen in my life. And so we stood up there, and he's looking down, and I said, Gee, this is really beautiful. He said, well, you know, every time I fly out here, he says, I drive up here. He says, that's why I have this Jeep. He said, I drive up here, and I says, he says, I spend a couple of hours. He says, sometimes I bring a, a bottle of uh, wine up here. He says, I have supper or something, and look out. And it's just fantastic. And you get this sense of timelessness. You have the feeling that this is the way the world looked when, uh, when uh, Darwin drifted down in that area and saw this strange country down there. And, of course, the animals and the birds in that, in that island, too, are worth, are worth seeing because island life, you know, is different from non-island life. Uh, uh, animals and birds, they, that, that most ornithologists and zoologists will tell you that, uh, that if, uh, if you travel around the world, if, uh, if it was possible to, to discover all the species that, were, that are existing in the world, that uh, quite probably the uh, that island life is the most varied, strange, exotic life that uh, of all the animal and the, the fauna and the flora of the world. In other words, there are animals that live on islands that live nowhere else, and they've developed specifically on that island. They're, they're specific, and, and they will not be 25 miles away. You'll go to the next island, and that creature doesn't exist over there. That's why when Darwin traveled around with the beagle, he, he made some very important discoveries that you couldn't make walking around, let's say, the plains in, in France or Brussels, that he saw things in the, in the Galapagos, uh, he saw things in islands like uh, down on the far southernmost reaches of the South Pacific that you'll never find anywhere else. Well, we, we spent the night there, you see, and, and the bird, the bird life is fantastic on this island. And I remember coming out of this little cabin, it's, you, you really feel it's a, it's a different kind of a tropical feel from... If you you know if you think of the tropics in terms of say uh, Barbados or the uh, our islands here which are really semi-tropical, uh, this is a different kind of a tropical feeling than you'll find any place else that I've found anywhere in, el- in the world because there is a is a softness in the air. It's a it's a it's a genuine tropical paradise. There's a, a languor, and uh, everything feels soft and and remote. You have the sense that uh, that the rest of the world just doesn't exist. I can understand why Gauguin went out of his mind in Tahiti in the early days of the of the life on Tahiti, which, of course, has changed drastically. 
And if you ever get a chance, uh, and this is, a, again, a, a word of personal advice, if you ever get a chance to travel out in the Pacific area, there are several things you can't miss. Uh, one of them is New Zealand. I, I, uh, I suspect that there's less said in the world about New Zealand. Uh, you, you don't hear many people talk about it, and yet uh, I, would, I, would ha I would venture to say that quite probably, if, if, you were, if there was any form of absolute beauty, if there was any standard of absolute beauty, uh, you'd have to you'd have to concede that New Zealand has to be one of the three or four most beautiful places on the face of the earth. Fantastic country physically, tremendous country, and uh, the the thing that hit me about New Zealand, the very first thing was the was the fact that you had a sense of New Zealand is roughly where the Bonnie and Clyde movie was. Uh, they're they're roughly in the early thirties. <laughs> That's what happens when you're remote, you know, for the rest of the world. And here, there, everybody's driving around 1928 Chryslers. Uh, every place you look, you see uh, uh, Willie's Overlands, and they're the regular cars. They're not uh, they're not collectors' items. A guy will go putting past you in a Graham Page, and there he goes, you know, in his car. And it's a curious sense. In fact, they're even more English there that I I felt than they are in England. There's an extremely English quality to it, but. Uh, back to Lord Howe Island. That little trip now, that, uh, that was just a weekend trip. And so that's the kind of thing you can do in Australia. In fact, I, I remember coming into the hotel lobby. It's kind of a little shock, you know, <laughs> to see uh, a hotel lobby. There's a sign there, and it said, uh, Why not make it a Fiji weekend? Well, you know, you you really suddenly hit how far away you are from home where the people think in terms of taking a long weekend, they go to Fiji. I mean, they think of uh, when I'm going to take a long weekend, why not go to, uh, you know, Guadalcanal? And they do. Uh, <laughs> and, and it, it kind of hit me that minute, saying, sure, you could buy And it's very inexpensive. You buy, a t you know, you buy a ticket. And uh, just like today, if uh, here you are in New York City, somebody says, why not try an Atlantic City weekend? And the natives think nothing of it, of course. And uh, speaking of natives, uh, I, I had a strange experience. You know, there's all kinds of American emigrants over there, and uh, they're they're uh, they're an odd lot uh, in in many ways. And uh, one day I took a plane. This was a private plane, and flew out of Sydney to a place called Cops Harbor, which is up the coast, and it's in a very tropical area. In that area, they uh, you see these old gentlemen. Uh, uh, bowling uh, on the green, you know, they uh, right in the middle of every Australian. City, it's everything is so sedate. You get a sense of total peace there. Nothing is hurried. And here, these old gentlemen dressed in in white ducks, wearing uh, white straw Panama hats, and these elegant white shirts that absolutely spotless with a with a their club tie. They're wearing a black tie or a green tie, whatever bowling club they belong to. And the green has been clipped for a hundred years. And here's the bowling green lying right in the middle of this little town. It's Sunday afternoon. And Sunday afternoon in, a, in an Australian small town is, is a genuine experience. It's, it's, it's something else again. And he's all generally... In fact, it's so quiet in this town that you could be two miles away and you can hear the click of bowling balls hitting together on the green. Uh, you just... You hear these little... You hear old ladies twittering, and the the birds and the quiet tropical air. And I, I got out of the plane, which was which, in case you're curious, if you're a flying type, that plane happened to be a a uh, 172 uh, Cessna a Skyline. We crawled out of the plane, and and uh, I walked over to the to the uh, to the terminal there, the airport terminal. And here was one guy sitting in his cab, and uh, I climbed in the back, and he says, "Where it to, mate?" And I said, listen, I said, I'd, how would you like to spend about an hour with me? He said, you're on. And uh, I said, well, just let's just drive around. He said, fine. So we drove all around, and he said that he wanted to show me his, you know, the place. And so he took me out to a banana plantation. And uh, I, I struggled my way through the undergrowth in this banana plantation. And here some guy had built a stand. It was like a house made in the shape of a banana. A tremendous banana. And, uh, you know, they hand you bananas. Just bananas, are, you know, for the equivalent of a nickel, you can get 25 pounds of bananas. You know, there's no problem at all. So so uh, I went into the guy's house, and he's an American there. 
It's an American who emigrated, though, maybe 15 years ago. Incidentally, an Olympic mile runner, famous runner. And uh, I, I walked up on the on the porch of his pad there, and instantly I'm hit. I had this sense of, of, of being in, uh, definitely, I was in a, a true life portrayal of a Somerset Maugham short story. You could hear the tropical birds, and there's this guy sitting on the on the porch, uh, wearing wearing old battered, uh, scuffed white uh, tennis shoes, and he's got a pair of, of worn, scuffed, torn shorts, and he's got his shirt is torn open, and he's bronze, and he's got a gin and tonic in his hand, and he's on his banana plantation, twelve and a half billion miles away from all existence and out from in back of his house comes this beautiful beautiful polynesian girl who brought us drinks on a tray a bamboo tray and we're sitting there drinking banana squash with a little a little dash of vodka in it that's what he was drinking see with a little with a little soda water it's a strange combination we're sitting on his on his porch and you could hear the wind blowing just a slight soft tropical breeze blowing through the banana trees. Now, banana trees have got the... Have you seen pictures of banana? Have you ever seen a banana tree? Well, you know, they've got these great sweeping leaves kind of hang over. And whenever the wind blows through them, you hear this... It's the it's a, it's a sound of the banana trees, the wind blowing through them. And so we went through his banana groves. He was showing me these. He's a very laconic character. And uh, he'd, heard, he'd read my stuff in Playboy, by the way, which is kind of an odd feeling. He gets Playboy out there. So... <laughs> And <laughs> we talked a little bit about that. And finally, he says, well, he said, uh, good flight. I got back in a cab, and we drove out to the airport. The next minute, I'm airborne. And now he's probably, there he is. He's out there. Of course, right now, he's, uh, it's at this time, it's just exactly the opposite. It's, uh, it's a different time of day over there. It's a different uh, season of the year over there. Probably doesn't even remember that I came there. I, I suspect, though, he does, because he, not many people come to that part of Australia. And I, I you know, this is a curious show tonight. I'll, I'll frankly admit something to you now at this point. I had no idea of doing an Australian show. I did not plan an Australian show tonight. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so what, you know? But uh, if, you ever, if you ever have any doubts about spending any money on traveling, friend, forget it. I'm serious. Uh, my, the people that I always feel sorry for are people who are old and are about to depart this mortal coil who have never traveled, who have never really seen the world. And it doesn't take a lot of money, you know. It really doesn't, because it's amazing how people tend to spend a lot of money on junk. They will buy more clothing, which six months from now they don't even remember they bought, they will buy more idiotic things for the kitchen, which two months later wind up in the, you know, wind up in the attic someplace. All that money could be put to infinitely better use. It's a matter of reordering your priorities, knowing what you want to do, and by God, doing it. It's a big world out there. But uh, someday I want to go back to Australia. And uh, the next time I go back to Australia... I've got a lot of plans of what specifically I'm going to do as far as shows and that are concerned. It's a great country. This is WOR New York.